build your life on your faith. story of Palm Sunday today, and I'm going to take it from Matthew chapter 21. You're welcome to turn there. I'm not going to read the entire story. You probably know it quite well or a little bit familiar with it, perhaps. I'll kind of narrate it a little bit, take some verses out of it, and share uh, what I believe we want to we wanna get across today. The title of the message today is this. Change the system. Change the system. Now, um, you may wonder what's he talking about, but uh, by the end of this morning's service, you're going to appreciate what I mean by change the system. I would like for you to say it to your neighbor because not only are we going to talk about it in, in terms of salvation and redemption and what Christ has done for us, but I'm going to share with you as we go along how you can have an absolute change in your life if you'll just change the system. So look at your neighbor and tell them, change the system. See, people want change. They want things to happen in their life, but it's sometimes you got to change the system and you get the change you want. You'll, you'll, you'll understand here as we go along. Change the system. So in Matthew chapter 21, we have the story of Palm Sunday. It's Jesus going up to Jerusalem. The triumphal entry into Jerusalem, we call it. Lots of different terminology for it. It is interesting that it is one of the only stories, just a, just a few, I should say, that are found in all of the Gospels. All of the Gospels means all the writings, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We call those the Gospels, and in all four of those, this story is given. It must be quite important then, don't you think? His triumphal entry into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, going to Jerusalem as king and as the Lord that he was to be. It tells that story through here, and I'm going to pick out four things that are kind of major things in that, in that day as he went up there to Jerusalem, did some things there, came back and so forth. I'm going to pick out four things, share the truths of them with you and, in, and, and um, also help you and I in our personal life to change the system that really will bring change in our life. Uh, it's going to be good. So Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. We find it in the story here. And many of us know the part where he was riding on a donkey. The people were throwing down their clothes. They take off their garment, throw it down. Even the donkey he was riding on had the clothes of the disciples. They took off their clothes and put it on him and then sat him on it. And he rode up there on that donkey. Now, the significance, and oh, there's so much significance in all of that day. Let me just preface it right here by saying that had to be a big day. This was not just Jesus deciding he wanted to go to McDonald's in Jerusalem that day for breakfast. This was a day set in eternity because the Old Testament prophet said he set his face like flint toward Jerusalem. That means he came to this earth and he had his focus, his eye, his attention, his plan was to go to Jerusalem. He was going to go there no matter what. It was the plan and purpose of God and Jesus was set toward this day of going to Jerusalem. So this is not just Another day that someone wakes up and goes, I think I'll go into town. 
We'll have breakfast here and we'll meet up with some people here or there. This is a day of God's eternal purposes being accomplished through the Son of God. He is riding to Jerusalem and every detail holds in it such significance and such power and such truth for that day. I could go on and on and on about it. Why did he ride on a donkey? How many of you know that we have a term called the suffering servant? Jesus said to be great, you come as a servant of all. Donkeys rode, rode, gave rides. People rode donkeys. We should get, how would you say that? Donkeys, donkeys were ridden by, oh, there you go. Donkeys were ridden by working people. They were beasts of, right, beasts of burden. And this was a colt on which no one had ever ridden. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't normally get on a donkey that has never been ridden. Uh, I mean, all of us equestrian folks, we wouldn't get on a horse or a colt or a donkey, for sure not a donkey. Have you ever been around a donkey? <laughs> Why does he get on a colt that is never a donkey? Some translations have in there a colt, but a donkey is what it really was. Why did he get on this beast of burden? Because he is going to go as a working man. He is going to do a job. If he had been a king who had already conquered, he would have ridden a horse. He would have ridden in victory up to Jerusalem. And he would have ridden there because a king who had already conquered always rode in on a horse displaying his conquest, his greatness, and all of that. But Jesus as a servant for us is going to go to Jerusalem on a donkey that has never been ridden. And they tell me the best way to break a donkey for riding is to put a very heavy burden on him. No donkey has ever carried a burden like this donkey that carried Jesus to Jerusalem. No donkey has ever been loaded with 500 pounds, 400 pounds, 100 pounds, whatever uh, they may be able to carry. No donkey has ever been saddled down with any greater weight than the day of eternity's purpose. When Jesus rode one to Jerusalem. I believe even a donkey understood the weight of that day. And rode him, rode him, took him. It just doesn't work right, does it? He rode the donkey to Jerusalem. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why? Because he is going not as a king who has conquered, but he's going to Jerusalem to do a work. And he would eventually rise, of course, as the conquering victorious king. But they saw him coming and they put their garments down, palm branches down. Hosanna. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're singing the psalm, Psalm 118, which is the psalm they would sing when kings would come in to Jerusalem. And so they're singing Psalm 118, and it talks about the mercy of the Lord endures forever. And what he would do is he comes, and he came to Jerusalem Riding on that donkey, they put their clothes down before him. What does that mean? They put their clothes down before him. They are saying, here comes the king and we are taking off our identity and we're putting it under him. It's all has meaning in it. People's clothes had their identity attached to it. Like the blind man, he wore a certain garment 
And when Jesus came to heal him, he threw that garment off and went to Jesus. These people recognized a king and they said, let's put our identity in him. All according to scripture. All according to scripture. So the first thing is Matthew chapter 21 verse 7. Here's a part of that story. You can see it here on the screen. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. Jesus was going to do a work in Jerusalem. Aren't you glad he did it? Aren't you glad he did it? I mean, I mean, uh, when he was talking to Elijah and Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration, do you remember what he talked about? I'll tell you since you don't remember. He talked with Moses and Elijah about the death which he would die. And here's what it says in one gospel. It says he talked to them about the death which he would accomplish. I like that word. He's going to Jerusalem and he's beginning the work of accomplishing a death. That means he wasn't going to die just a normal death. This death he was going to die was going to accomplish something. And he's talking to Elijah and to Moses and he's saying, this death, I'm going to die. I've come, I've set my face like flint toward Jerusalem and I'm going to die a death that is going to accomplish the salvation of the world that whoever believes in me should not perish but have everlasting life. Yeah, he's going to Jerusalem to accomplish something. No man has ever driven a car, ridden on a beast, ridden on an animal. No person has ever been transported somewhere with a greater mission than on Palm Sunday. Because now it begins the week of passion. What did he do? He went up there to change a system. And he began his work. These scriptures that, I'm, that we're looking at and this story is often used to preach individual messages from, for example, in this story is the fig tree that was cursed. Remember that? And lots of times we hear sermons that you can speak to your mountain and it'll be removed. You know, the power of your words are taken from there. I just, I have a problem with believing that on this trip, Jesus took this trip to show the disciples how powerful their words were. I just don't think that he set his face toward Jerusalem so that he could ride on a donkey and then tell them the reason I came up here to do this is to make sure you know that your words are powerful. Now that may be a side lesson and it usually is. There are lots of lessons off to the side of what's really happening. I believe you can take it from there. You can use it as a part of the importance of our words. But friend, I believe the cursing of the fig tree was way more important than just a lesson on our words. I believe the cursing of the fig tree was a prophetic work of the Lord Jesus. He is beginning his work in changing a system. And now he is up there and he comes out of Jerusalem according to the accounts of the Gospels. He goes to Jerusalem. And if some of them have it a little differently, one of them says, Mark says he cursed the fig tree as he was going, went on to Jerusalem, came back. Matthew says he went to Jerusalem, came out to Bethany. Uh, you know, a little bit of, not sure which one came first, but what we do know is when he came back out of Jerusalem, the next day the fig tree was dead. So what, you say, what do you think he was doing cursing the fig tree? 
Well, very most scholars agree that the fig tree in the Old Testament, it says something like this. When the fig tree blooms again, it's talking about Israel coming back as a nation and kind of that whole thing. I personally don't believe it's just Israel by itself. I believe the fig tree is the whole system. The fig tree represented the whole Judaic, the whole work of, of, of the Levitical priesthood, the whole old system. So here goes Jesus to Jerusalem and he curses a fig tree and says, let no man eat fruit of you again. Let no man eat. Now, how do I come to a conclusion like this? For those of you who would like to know and the rest of you who might be interested. <laughs> Jesus did not make a habit out of cursing things. Huh? I mean, we don't, this is not a pattern for him. He doesn't go around and find things that are faulty and curse them. What he does is finds things that have got problems and brings life to them. When water, when they didn't have enough wine, he made wine out of water for a wedding. Didn't he? When there weren't enough loaves and fishes for the whole multitude, he didn't curse the little lunch that wasn't enough. He multiplied the lunch and fed the people. I mean, God's Jesus pattern was to bless things and bring life and multiplication and cause things to live. So this was completely out of character for him. And besides that, he was never moved by hunger before. They said, well, he was hungry and looked for figs on the fig tree, and then he cursed it. Nowhere else was he ever moved by hunger, not in the temptation with the enemy, not at the well of Samaria. When the Samaritan woman was talked to, you know, the disciples said, Jesus, you're tired and hungry. Eat this little Burger King lunch we picked up over in Samaria. We, we brought you some lunch. And he says, no, I don't need to eat. I'm doing the work of my father. That's food enough for me. He wasn't moved by hunger. Jesus didn't get hungry and then get angry because there wasn't a meal. Are we doing okay? It had to have been greater. The axe was being laid to the root of the tree and Jesus was changing a system. And he's saying that old system, nobody will eat fruit from you ever again. What does that mean for us today? That means the law and the things that you can bring to gain acceptance with God, nobody can gain righteousness through that ever again. And they never could anyway. But he's changing a system. And then he says, if anyone says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and doesn't doubt in their heart. Now, how many of you have ever wanted to move a mountain? No, not me. I didn't. I mean, I, I know what you mean when you say I do. I know exactly. And we could have all said 100 percent. I want to move a mountain. But I don't know about you. I've never looked at a mountain and went, I'd like to move that thing. Figuratively speaking, we say mountains in our life and that, but that's not what he was saying. Look at, look at your scripture. It says this mountain. He's looking at a mountain. He's looking at the mount. He's looking at Jerusalem, which is up on a hill. And he is saying this mountain gets removed out of your life, the system that is, when you call on the name of the Lord. Romans chapter 10, the word is near you even in your mouth, this word of faith which we preach, that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
How does the mountain of evidence against you get removed? How, does it, how is it that you need no sacrifices? How is it that you don't have to pay for anything? How is it that you come by grace through faith alone? It is by your confession, your mouth, you just speak, and that mountain of condemnation is gone. There's no way that Jesus went up to Jerusalem on that big day just to teach his disciples a lesson on speaking. Amen. He's telling us there's a new system. Yes. You don't need to bring a lamb. You don't need to come to this mountain. You don't need to come and bring a sacrifice. What you need to do is speak. Next one. What's he do next or before? The two kind of are in between. According to one account, he spoke to the fig tree, went to Jerusalem, and then went to the temple, then came back out, and they saw the fig tree had died. So we do know he went to the, to the temple, and he looked around to see how the temple was doing. And then he goes in there, and what does he do? This is, this is the, the famous part. In case you haven't seen it, I'll, I'll read it to you here or show it to you on the screen. Oh, let's see here. Where is this verse? Um... Verse 12, 21, verse 12, Matthew 21, 12. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Verse 13. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So he goes into the temple and he overturns the money changers. One account says he actually made a whip and drove those people out of there. And so the, the picture is pretty clear. He wasn't real happy. He wasn't real excited about what was going on there. And, and it's pretty clear that there was an anger about his demeanor at that point. And he, he overturned the money changers. Can't you just see money flying everywhere? I mean, just overturning tables and, and, and running them out of there. I mean, he get out of the temple. Hey, just a little side note. Just a little side note. If Jesus didn't want us to meet in buildings and meet as a body, as a church, as in the house of God, he should have changed it right there. People say, well, we're the temple now. We, me personally, we're the temple. That's right. But no one or anywhere ever changed the gathering of God's people to worship God. If Jesus wanted that changed, he should have changed it right here. He still called the temple his house. It, the, if someone else wanted it changed, the Apostle Paul, Peter, somebody should have changed it other than us. And they didn't. They went up to the temple to pray daily, as was the custom in the early church, didn't they? There's something powerful about a house of God that people meet in to worship. God wanted it with the tabernacle. He wanted it with the early temple. He still wants it that way in the New Testament. If he or the apostles would have changed it, I'd be okay with it. But they didn't. And if it was good enough for them, it's good enough for me. This would have been a good opportunity for Jesus to have said, who needs anything like this? It'll all be in people now. He didn't. He called it his father's house and a house of prayer. What should church be? Why do we have a temple, a building, a place where we meet together? It's a place where we fellowship and come, a house of prayer where we experience and together enjoy the benefits of our relationship with God. 
Just a little side note I thought you'd like to know. Because there's a big movement today for people to say, why do we even have church? Why do we even gather together? Have you ever found if you've gone to church at all, there's stuff that happens at church that doesn't happen when you're by yourself. Something's happening right now for people. There's something that you get, you feel, you hear, you see, that you just don't see by yourself. It's meant to be that way. So Jesus goes in there and this house, he says, is my father's house. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. He turns over the money changers, kicks them out of there, the people who sold doves. And here's, here's, I don't believe he was angry because there was money in God's house. I don't think he was angry because they were selling messages, CDs that need to be paid for, MP3s or those kind of things. I don't think it was an anger that there was money in God's house. Here's what he was doing. He was changing a system. Because actually they were doing what the law told them to do. There's provision. You can go read it in Leviticus. If you don't have the prescribed sacrifice at your house, you can buy one. That's right. It's right there in the law itself. If you don't have a spotless lamb to offer at the temple, when you go up to worship, you can buy one because your money can buy. They're selling doves not for wedding parties and stuff. They're selling doves for sacrifices. This is part of the prescription of sacrifice. So we don't have one. The family doesn't have it. We'll go on to the temple and we'll buy one when we get there. Jesus isn't angry because there's money in God's house. He is changing a system. He's saying this is over. You can't buy anything for your salvation anymore. There's no sacrifice you can bring that you've paid for. You can't bring enough good works. You can't bring enough of anything that you have earned for anything in this house. The system is changed. And he kicks it all over. And what happens next? If you're in that chapter, you'll see it. The next thing that happens is it says they bring the lame and the blind and he heals them. (laughs) Once you get rid of the system of trying to earn something, you can expect miracles. He'll do things for you by grace that nothing else will accomplish. You can't pay for your miracle. You can't do enough for for your eternal salvation. All you can do is get rid of everything that has anything to do with what you can earn and let him come with his grace and his power and who he is and he will heal you. The reason miracles have subsided in the body of Christ today is because we've made a system out of them. And once we get back to the grace and the fullness of Jesus Christ, you'll see a river of God's miraculous work unlike anything you've ever seen. We've made a system out of faith. We've made a system out of this. We've made a system out of that. And we wonder why don't we see more things? Kick them over. Get rid of the stuff we can earn and receive what the king has come to bring. Change of system. You can change your system. Let's get real practical here. You can change your system at your house just by changing your words. Speak to the mountain. How powerful is it just changing what you say? You know, most marriages, family relations, tension in houses, in homes could be changed today if people just changed the system of their words. What are you waiting for? You're just going to keep talking like you used to and hope to have a different life? Just change the system. (laughs) You can change everything just by your confession. 
just by confessing Jesus as the Savior and as the one who did everything for us, the whole system changes for you. And not one thing under the law will ever be held against you. There will never be a checklist for your life if you will put your faith in Jesus Christ. There will never be a clipboard pulled out with a checklist that says, well, are you good enough to get your healing? Are you good enough to go to heaven? Did you do enough of this? Did you do enough? There will never be that because that was all nailed to the cross. And all it takes from us is trusting him and saying, and that mountain moves and we have faith in God. But for our practical life, I mean, you could just change your whole system. Just change how you speak about your job. You can still have the same job tomorrow, and tomorrow will look completely different when you get there if you just change your words about it today. Amen. 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 So he says, man, I wish I had a new job if, I just, if we just had, if I just, if I, if we just had. I'd be happy if I just, if I just had, I'd be happy. I'm telling you, you could change the whole system just by changing your words today. You could change your whole life if you just kept, if you just stopped holding people accountable to your checklist. <laughs> if you'd quit making people pay for your acceptance, your whole life could change. We'd have a whole change of system. If somebody would just release their spouse from the whole system of, ch of checks and expectations they've held against them for the last 15, 20, 1, 50 years, the whole system would change. You could change your house today. Kick those, cha those money changers over. Kick those tables over and quit making people pay for what they bring. Amen. Well, I'll love them if they ever do this right. God will accept me if I ever, I don't know if I can ever come to God because I, I know how much I failed. Jesus kicked the money changers, those tables over and he's come with the grace of a new system that if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. <laughs> Woo, glory, hallelujah. Change the system. People want things to change. Change the system. Start talking differently. You'd have a whole change. Release people from buying their way into your life. It's what Jesus went to Jerusalem to do. Change the system. And make sure that they knew they could have access to the Father without something they paid for. Because he came to do a work. And he called it a house of prayer, which means you have direct access access and fellowship to him. Remember he was, God was kind of hidden in the Holy of Holies. Now Jesus comes along and shakes that whole system and says, this is a house of prayer. Prayer is fellowship with God. Every person who comes there now has access. Don't need to buy. Don't need to bring something. Just put your faith and trust in the king, the lamb, the one who has come to do a work. And this house is a house of prayer. Woo, glory. We're kicking over some tables today. <laughs> kicking over some tables. Uh, come on, come on, you, you sour-faced Christians. <laughs> That's the ones who want to be Christians, but it's no joy to you because you thought it was some code you had to follow. 
and you're still trying to live up to some code that you think it is, friend, there is no code. There only is salvation through Jesus Christ. The work is finished. You can't go up to a table and buy enough of anything. Kick the table over and come into the presence of God and live a joyful Christian life because he's not holding anything against you. Quit holding it against yourself and others. Glory. <laughs> the last thing I got to tell you before we go is he healed them. I already said it, but it says he healed. They brought the lame, they brought the, the, the blind, and he healed them. Friend, the blessing of God is not under an old system. It's under the blessing of Jesus Christ. Oh, I just want to tell you so much and quote so many scriptures. In the book of Hebrews, it says, it says that the old is obsolete. That means it's not in use anymore. You don't pull out old obsolete computers and try to get something out of them. I have some old computers in my barn from the 1990s. I wanted to do some work this morning. I, I created a video this morning. Uh, well, last night, late last night, I was creating a video. And, and uh, I didn't go out to my barn and go, hey, let me get one of these old obsolete computers and see if I can create a video. There's not even enough memory in those crazy things to even process probably one picture I used on this new computer. It just can't do it. I mean, light the things up and, and I, they just can't, can't handle it. I mean, we have more memory on our phones now than those computers had. Right. You can do more. You could edit more stuff on your phone than that old computer I've got laying in the barn. That's what people are doing today. We want to get healed. We'd like to get to heaven. We'd like to be blessed. We'd like to have God smile upon us. We'd like to have him say you're righteous and you're okay. We'd like to know for sure that we're going to heaven when we die. We'd like to have all of that. And then they go to the barn and pull out an obsolete computer. Try to put us back under the law and tell us what we have to do and don't have to do and what all we need to fulfill and what all we have to do. There's even people trying to get us back under Judaism and all that kind of stuff. That, you know, if you do this right and you wave the right flag and you do the right dance and you, and you, and you do the prescriptions that they have, then you can be blessed. Like one person said to me at the door here at church, so sincerely one time said, you know why shining light isn't blessed. That's right. Oh, you'd be surprised what, we, what you hear at the door. <laughs> My favorite one is, you're finally preaching something we've heard three months ago. Like... Thank God, you, thank God you're finally caught up to Kenneth Copeland or somebody, you know. We heard that three months ago. Thank God you're finally preaching it. You know? kind of, oh, thank you. Praise the Lord. I'm so, so glad that I finally caught on. <laughs> yeah, sorry, shouldn't get into that. <laughs> You'd have to be a pastor to understand. You'd be surprised what you hear. You know, so somebody said, somebody said, uh, the reason shining, I mean, they're just sincere, man. I'm like, oh, tell me. Well, the reason they're not, we're not being blessed at shining light is because we don't keep the feasts of Israel. I said, oh, really? Feasts of Israel? Of course, a thousand scriptures just rush through you, you know, and a thousand is an exaggeration, but a lot of scriptures rush through you, you know, and, and I, I, I said, and I couldn't help myself. I have this side of me that, <laughs> that hopefully you never encounter, but <laughs> no, I just have this side of me, you know, I, I'm that person that sometimes when people come up behind you and they, they toot their horn at you because you're going too slow. I'm the person that slows down. <laughs> <laughs> 
don't tell anybody. <laughs> and I don't look. I just slide down in my seat a little bit farther. <laughs> and just and try not to use my brakes. I shifted into a lower gear. Uh, it's, it's, I, okay, okay, that's too much. So you didn't need you didn't need to know any of that. <laughs> and so and so <laughs> And so sometimes, but anyway, so in this case, uh, you, you we're not blessed because we're not keeping the feast of Israel. I just couldn't help myself. I said, we do keep the feast of Israel. We keep them perfectly. We do. I've never seen, never seen us do the feast of Pentecost. And we, we do. I have uh, How come I've never seen it? I said, oh, we keep every one of them to perfection. I mean, you'd be amazed how we keep the feasts here at Shining Light. About the time their eyes are that big, I said, yeah, we keep them all in Jesus Christ. He's done them all. He is the feast. You don't need to keep a feast. He fulfilled them when he went up to Jerusalem. You want me to tell you some more stories? <laughs> now, you all don't even like the spiritual stuff. You just want my stories. <laughs> I see how you are. Forget the spiritual stuff. Tell us more about the driving and stuff. <laughs> huh? <laughs> oh, you wouldn't want me to tell you what I do to solicitors on the phone. Have you ever heard of such a thing as tongues? That's fun stuff. That's fun stuff. Huh? And you always know it's a solicitor. You always know it's a solicitor because there's a pause. Right? There's always a pause. I mean, and you might hear a click because the machine is switching something. So there's this pause and you're like, oh... Yeah, right. And so, so when I'm having those kind of days and I need a little humor, <laughs> it's right. Is, and then the next clue is they don't know your name. Yeah. Right. So is, uh, is Stephen Stadadabak? <laughs> and I'll be, oh, I got your name and number. I know you're a solicitor. And so by the time they finish that, is, is he here? And then you just, is Stephen there? Is Jennifer there? You know? Oh, some Yeah. <laughs> Click. <laughs> uh, you didn't need to know that. Okay. You want more of them? I'm not telling you anymore. The system has changed. You can change the system at your house, change the words, quit holding a list up against people and release them from the money changers. Change the system around you. Love people with God's unconditional love and receive it from Him. He has changed the system. Huh? <laughs> he has changed the system. He cursed the fig tree. No man eat fruit from you ever again. You know what that means? That means you'll never stand before God and have fruit to offer him. 
for your acceptance. You'll never look to a fig tree ever again and wonder that it doesn't have fruit. You'll never look there for your hunger to be satisfied. When somebody is hungry, they don't go to a fig tree anymore. The system of works, the system of sacrifices, the system of paying for something, the system of bringing something perfect from us. You'll never look there again to satisfy the hunger because it can't satisfy. You will come and drink of the water of life freely. Whew. The spirit and the bride say come and drink of the water of life freely. It's unbelievable and yet believable. It's too good to be true, and yet it's true. What would you receive today if you received based upon what he did and nothing you can offer? As the worship team comes to close us out today, because if they don't, I'll keep telling you stories. As they come, with every head bowed and every eye closed, this is Palm Sunday. What a day, what a week. What a day, what a week. That you would ride to Jerusalem, your face set like flint to change a system. It was in this week, it was right in this time of Passover that he instituted a whole new system, not one of sacrifice, not one of something we bring to offer, but his own blood and his own body. It was there that he instituted the communion. This is my body. This is my blood of the new covenant. He went to Jerusalem to change a system. Hallelujah. With every head bowed and every eye closed, would you like those people who saw him coming, and they threw their garments on the ground in front of him, they took off their own identity and said, let's identify with this king. Would you take your identity today and bring it to the feet of Jesus and say, I have nothing in myself to offer. I completely, I completely identify with him in terms of baptism, we would say it like this, I'm buried with him and I've risen to a new life. These are the kind of things you're gonna kick over. You're gonna kick over the tables where you would say, I think I'm a good enough of a person. I think I've done enough good works. Well, my parents were, you know, my parents, my grandparents. I hope I'm okay. Those kind of tables, we're kicking them over today and we're putting all our faith and trust in Jesus Christ for life and eternity. So here are the three invitations. Number one, will you put all your faith and trust in Jesus Christ today for your life and eternity? Number two, if you'd like to be filled with the Holy Spirit today, you can ask him and he'll fill you with his spirit. Number three, maybe you have something going on in your life. A prayer request, we would call it. Maybe a financial situation, a, a health issue, a, a, a relationship, whatever it might be. God cares about you so much. 
And by responding today, you're saying, I put my faith and trust in him for the answer for these things in my life. I'm expressing trust.